And Marco, you are here to educate us about the future of energy systems. Just spell out the opportunity that you see. Well, that's a big, big, big theme. Um, the opportunity is very simple. We have a trademark in my company that we call it PPWS. That stands for put the panels where it's sunny. So the global energy price, whichever way you make energy, from biomass, from burning wood, from coal, from nuclear, the global price is about 150 euros per megawatt hour. And my business partner, Paddy, he, he made solar energy available at 10 euros a megawatt hour. So from 10 to 150, there's a big, big opportunity. And the cost of solar used to be 1,000. So all we need to do is find sunny places with a lot of land and people willing to sell their sunshine, so to speak, so make revenues from putting solar panels in sunny places. And the same goes for wind turbines in windy places. But you need to put them where people want them, where there's space, where there's a lot of land. And then... Can I just pick up on this point? Because yeah. every time it seems like there's a simple solution then there's a more complex one behind the scenes. I mean, with solar, you then start to go to the whole point around storage, and yeah. that seems to be a problem. So, so how do you go from solving one piece and still having another major challenge on a renewable story? So that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years, is dealing exactly with those challenges. So I, I worked in uh, the world's largest uh, renewable energy company, but then I worked in also one of the world's largest oil and gas companies. So I was dealing with the electrons, which is solar energy, and with the molecules, which is what you store. And the beauty of hydrogen, and I'm a hydrogen fan, is that you transform the solar energy into a molecule that suddenly behaves like oil or gas or coal. You can store it, you can put it on a ship, you can move it around, and you use it when you need it. And what, what is often misunderstood is just how cost competitive that molecule can be. It can be a lot cheaper than fossil fuels today, with today's technology. And this wasn't the case only five years ago. So it's a very recent thing. And it has to do with the this, this steep fall in the price of solar energy. When do you see scale being achieved? So we are building uh, Europe's largest LNG terminal in Germany, in Willemshaven. Uh, and that terminal will import normal LNG, conventional gas. But increasingly, starting in 2026, we will import what we call ENG, electric natural gas. So that's natural gas made from hydrogen. So the problem with hydrogen, once you have it, say, in the desert of Texas or the desert of Tunisia or the desert of Australia, it's not so easy to transport the hydrogen into Germany or into the UK or where it's needed. Uh, so what we do is we do a second step. We convert the hydrogen into methane by putting it together with CO2. And then we have a completely renewable molecule that you can use whenever you need to. And this is going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper as the technology evolves and the cost of what we call the electrolyzers, which is what you need to make the hydrogen keep falling. So I'm not, you know, we need nuclear, we need wind, we need electric cars, we need all the solutions. Uh, but this is uh, uh, often misunderstood technology. It seems complex, it seems costly. It's actually a lot easier to produce than to drill for oil and gas, which was my previous job in, in you know, very deep seas. So you have transitioned as well. Mm -hmm. As we talk about pricing, do you naturally get to the point where you have success because of market mechanisms, or is it helpful at this point to have taxes that punish fossil fuels and windfall taxes that make it less competitive for traditional energy? I prefer the carrots to the sticks, generally as a business person, and the IRA is just a beautiful race to the top. Competition is great for business, and the fact that the US and China are competing on climate is very good for people like me who want to buy the cheapest equipment to make the cheapest possible energy. So uh, I think governments are doing the right things and Europe really has to catch up now because Europe was in the lead and now China's in the lead, the US is following, the Gulf is putting a lot of capital and technology around this transition uh, in, in, in the uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, uh, and Europe really needs to catch up. But the governments, what they can do is they can speed it up. So the market forces you know, will get there maybe in 10, 15 years. The real opportunity like we're doing is to try to get there in four to five years. Let me pick up on those comments then around the Inflation Reduction Act because there is genuine concern in Europe that they are being left behind, that there needs to be a European response. But, I mean, I tried to tackle this topic yesterday too with a yeah. European CEO, but the problem is that there is just a different mix of what subsidies, loans, grants, 
and then there's individual state and centres in the United States. You think about that from a European perspective, there's been years of fighting over grants, loans, subsidies, let alone individual and centres in, in various countries. So how quickly do you think Europe can get to an IRA response? Um, I think Europe will benefit uh, immensely from the IRA, more than, more than we were thinking. Uh, it will be in, what way? in the sense that you can export the IRA. So, so the incentive works that uh, just to take my product, and I'm going to make it in Texas for Europe. So my product with no subsidy costs about 100 euros a megawatt hour today, going to 50. That's the same price as uh, the cheapest nuclear available, and it's completely renewable. The IRA incentive is worth around 90 euros a megawatt hour. And yeah, that's a huge discount that I can use to make that molecule available uh, to Europe. But you're manufacturing in the United States. You're putting your headquarters there. No, and you're the headquarters, using supply chains there. The headquarters are in Brussels. Supply chains can be European supply chains. Uh, the problem is that if Europe doesn't build its own manufacturing fast enough, even the European companies are going to do more business in the US and in Europe. So that's really the challenge. That's where the race has to be. So Europe should really focus on the manufacturing, building the Airbuses. Airbus was a great example. Airbus competes with Boeing. Various European states joined forces and created a massive factory because they realized if we did it, you know, the French, the UK, the German way, it would be subscale. Can we talk about the mix that hydrogen will have in the energy systems of the future? What yes. percentage is it going to be? So um, there's now finally, I would say, a consensus. There used to be a completely fragmented or even polarized view of the world where the electron people, and this is true in the States, in France, in, in China, you have the oil companies and you have the utility companies. They are always separate. And so you had the oil companies saying it's all going to be oil and the utility companies saying it's all going to be electricity. The consensus now, finally, uh, if you ask like 20 experts, they'll say more or less the same thing. It's going to be 50%. This is a fully decarbonized energy system. 50% is going to be electrons. That means direct electricity. That means electric cars, electric heating, electric industry. Uh, and the other 50% is going to be green molecules. About half of that is going to be made through some form of hydrogen, and the other half some form of biofuels. And so hydrogen is going to be about 25% of the energy mix, which is huge. It's about the market share of oil today. By when? This is by 2050, but hopefully we start scaling it up very quickly uh, already this decade. So as we think about the amount of investment that has gone into big oil in the last 12 months or so, it's been a great place for some funds to park their money as they also look at the uh, dividend side too. How wrong-footed will that investment be up until 2030? Well, oil stocks uh, have peaked. So if you look at oil companies that are worth a lot of money today, they are not worth what they were 10 years ago. And oil stocks are great for dividends, and I, I suspect the market will continue to zigzag with the boom and bust cycles, uh, but they will continue to generate a, a lot of cash. So we need some of that cash to come, and it's coming into the energy transition as well. Uh, but the real opportunity is to build the type of infrastructure that we're building, because if you build an oil project, and I did plenty of those in very difficult places, Alaska, Ecuador, Siberia, if you build an oil and gas project, you have a depletion. So you're spending a lot of money, first of all, to have an engineer in Alaska up there. It's like $150 an hour, just the cost of having him there. So a lot of engineers, very expensive. And then every year, the, have a, you have a decline rate, a depletion rate. So you just have to keep spending just to stay still. That means the terminal value, to use a financial word, is, is very low of those assets. If you think of when I've connected the sun of Australia, the desert of Australia, to a factory in Germany, that connection reminds me of the Roman aqueducts or the Roman roads built 2,000 years ago. This is no longer the energy transition. This is kind of the end game. That the terminal value of that connection will last forever because the marginal cost of the sun is zero. And so you're building systems that are expensive, that require a lot of capital. The cost of that capital should be lower than anything else because it's just a huge business opportunity and the, they will last forever, so to speak. If we talk more about capital at this point, one of the criticisms around these big windfall taxes is that it stops investment from companies that would naturally be investing in energy transition, perhaps even partnering with you. Do you think that is the case, that uh, some of these major oil companies are now being held back from energy transition because of fiscal policy? I think there's uh, the narrative of energy security uh, shouldn't be used too much, but what I call the anti-ESG hit squads that are sometimes coming around here to Davos and other places. Uh, ESG is good for business. 
and taxes are generally bad for business. Uh, but I wouldn't, I, I'm glad I wasn't a politician in, in this last winter because Europe had to make very difficult choices and subsidizing fossil fuels and taxing fossil fuels is just, just, just difficult, right? And that's what happened. If you look at the subsidies that have been put in fossil fuels just to help people cope with their bills in Europe, we spent more than 500 billion euros already subsidizing essentially fossil fuels, ramping up coal production, but there wasn't an alternative Thankfully, in the five to six to seven years, there is an alternative, which is not only green, creates jobs, uh, but is also just ultimately a lot cheaper. We spent a lot of time, obviously, watching stock markets at CNBC, and you know, something that got somewhat beaten up in uh, the lost momentum was the green energy stocks as a sector. What are you seeing on the capital front? Is access to capital becoming a little bit tighter because of the credit conditions? So when a project is bankable, that means you have a customer, you have a contract, you have land and permits, so it takes a couple of years to make a project bankable. There is almost infinite capital for those projects because there's so much private capital, whether it's in the private equity funds, the infra funds, the sovereign wealth funds, the pension funds themselves, the corporates, the oil and gas companies, they all want to get exposure to the projects. So sometimes the private markets are a little longer term thinkers than the public markets. And I think the public market capital moves in and out of stocks more easily. And so people just saw an opportunity to take the dividends from the oil and gas companies. But I think the model of the utilities, to your point, where you try to do 100 gigawatts of renewables using your balance sheet and generating a lot of debt, then suddenly interest rates go up, your margins go down, that's very risky. The model I love about the oil and gas industry, it's very collaborative. If you take any project, Exxon, a lot of their production is not operated by Exxon. They're in partnership with BP, with Shell, with Total, with Annie, where I used to work. Uh, so that collaboration needs to happen in the energy transition. One of the main criticisms uh, that we hear quite often from some investors is that if I want to invest in new technology, new green technology, the problem is it may just get disrupted or the rules could change, government rules could change the nature of that investment. How do you navigate that minefield? Well, we like to invest, and we have some investments, we like to invest in future-proof uh, companies without taking too much technology risk. So one of the problems with the energy transition, uh, the markets were so hot over the last five or six years that a lot of people I know who are brilliant inventors, they have the IP and they're holding on to the IP. They don't have the capital or the ecosystem to scale that up because they just want to create a big company themselves. So I think we need capital to go to IP, but we need IP to go to companies that can then turn it into like a mass scale produced uh, technology. Uh, but, but there's some really uh, good investment opportunities for projects that are have low technology risk that are bankable and scalable and replicable. If you follow these rules, the investment cases are a lot easier. So when it comes to your own individual company, is there a risk that you could get disrupted? No, there's no risk because over time, as time goes by, as new technology becomes available, we just become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so we're going to rush and race to stay ahead of the curve. And we are the disruptors. Um, the reason I stepped away and off uh, being CEO of a very large multi-billion dollar business to put my savings and, and my career into a new uh, company is because to disrupt your much, and I was hoping to disrupt the, the sector from the platform of a very large multi-billion dollar business, but I realized you can be a lot more disruptive when you're new and, and fresh. EasyJet was, would never have been born within uh, uh, Lufthansa or Tesla would never have been born inside Ford. You need to, if you start from scratch, you're a lot more agile. So hopefully we're the disruptors. I want to get into energy security because it is something that we are having to rethink. Obviously, the war in Ukraine has had a monumental impact. As we build out new green energy systems, what do we need to think about to ensure that there are no problems, whether it's climate related, whether it's security related? What's key here? So the key about security, which I prefer the word resilience, energy resilience is, is more of a rounded word because security sometimes becomes the enemy of climate. But ener energy resilience needs molecules. And in Germany, they have this beautiful expression called Dunkenflaute. It's like a day with no sun and no wind. And, and then you have a cold Dunkenflaute where you need a lot of energy, you have no sun and no wind. So you need to have a molecule stored underground somewhere. And that can be hydrogen, that can be ammonia, that can be methanol, that can be our product, which is ENG, electric natural gas, uh, that can be biofuels, but you need to have molecules stored underground. That's why prices are low right now, because we have the storages are full. 
and Italy led the way, and I was a big part of that narrative when I was in my previous job as CEO of SNAM, is, is really, you know, you just see the impact now of very low energy prices compared to a few months ago just because the storages are full. So storage is key, molecules are key. You can't just store energy in a battery uh, for seasonal use. It makes no sense. Batteries are good for, like, daily uses. Can I ask you, as you look at the landscape across Europe, what jumps out to you about how the entire system has been re-geared to replace sources of energy from Russia? How far do you think the system has moved now? We shouldn't fool ourselves. It's not over. It will take four or five years for us to be in a safe place because that's when more LNG is going to be available from the US and from Qatar, and more of our renewable molecules are going to start coming to market at scale. Uh, so if we have a cold winter next year, it's going to be very, very challenging. They're, they're, you know, uh, let's not hide it. If, if it's cold, with this energy system, we will have blackouts. Um, so we've just been very lucky uh, that the winters has been incredibly warm and that we started the winter with the storages uh, that were full. Uh, the, we shouldn't confuse infrastructure with gas. So what we're doing in Germany is building a regasification terminal to import gas. That doesn't mean we've solved a security issue. It's a necessary but not sufficient condition because that needs to be filled up with gas. And so when China, the, the problem with gas, and that's where security is, it's all about natural gas. Oil is not an issue, it's only about natural gas. The market is all in the northern hemisphere, and we use it for heating. So when it's cold in China, it's cold in Europe, it's cold in the US, and there's no demand really in the southern hemisphere. So it's a very seasonal commodity. And so we need to just watch out for the next winter and the following one, and then hopefully the problem is over. Marco, it's been so fascinating. Thank you so much for stopping by for this fireside. I very much appreciate the time uh, with us. Marco Alvaro, the CEO of TES. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.